Committee will come to order. Pursuant to Committee Rule 4, House Rule uh, 11, Clause 2, the Chair may postpone further proceedings today on the question of approving any measure or matter ado or adopting an amendment on which a recorded vote or the yeas and nays are ordered. Without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, over the past few weeks, this the committee has worked uh, with our veteran service organizations and other stakeholders on uh, the six bipartisan measures we are considering today. Our Economic Opportunity Subcommittee has written legislation to improve uh, GI Bill benefits for service members, students, student veterans, and their families. Legislation offered by Congressman Cisneros will provide legal services to homeless veterans after uh, Congress, uh, Congressman Levin and Bilirakis held two field hearings on veteran homelessness in their districts. General Bergman and Dr. Rowe wrote legislation to phase out the Montgomery GI Bill, which requires service members to pay for their educational benefits so that the military uh, and veteran community once and for all does not have to worry about a return to that program. The post 9-11 GI Bill is the forever GI Bill. Service members and veterans who served should not be forced to pay for their educational benefits. The ONI subcommittee has uh, put forward legislation authored by Congressman Rowe and, uh, that will promote transparency and accountability at VA by requiring the posting of VA reports online. General Bergman's bill, which I supported last Congress, closes a loophole for veteran-owned small businesses contracting with VA, so those businesses owned by veterans and service -able, disabled veterans get a contracting preference because they are actually performing the work and not passing it on to non-veteran-owned businesses. Finally, Congressman Pappas's legislation requires VA to act on the Government Accountability Office's recommendations to remove the Veterans Health Administration and VA acquisition from GAO's high risk, GAO's high risk list. When we work together, we write better legislation. This legislation will improve veterans' benefits and opportunities and will hold the department, which solely exists to serve veterans, accountable to Congress and the veterans it serves. I look forward to reporting these bipartisan bills out of committee so that we can put them on the floor under suspension without delay. I now recognize Dr. Rowe for his opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, everyone. As you mentioned in your opening statement, we are here this morning to mark up six bills brought forth by the Subcommittee on Economic Opportunity and Oversight and Investigations. I will be supporting those bills because I believe they contain worthy provisions that could improve the provision of benefits and services to veterans. That said, I do have some concern about the legislative process and fair consideration of issues important to veterans I'd like to address. Mr. Chairman, most of the bills that we are voting on today have not had the benefit of, of any consideration in their respective subcommittees. That means they have not uh, been subject of legislative hearings where their merits are debated, markups where their provisions are perfected. I believe that these bills are well intended, but intentions do not matter if the legislation is unclear, if the policy is unsound, or if the executive branch is unable to carry them out. Neither we nor our staffs are omnipotent, and that's where regular order can help us all. We put our legislative ideas onto paper, we put those ideas through the legislative process to identify blind spots and to make sure that our, best, our work is the best it can be. And that's what our constituents sent us here to do, and that's what our veterans and taxpayers deserve. Because we have not done that with several bills today, I cannot say with confidence that they represent our best work because we do not have the views and cost estimates from the Department of Veterans Affairs, I cannot say with confidence they are feasible, because veteran service organizations who represent millions of veterans across the country and other key stakeholders have not been given the opportunity to voice, uh, had to have their voices heard, I cannot say with confidence that they are advisable. I recognize that there are circumstances when we dispense with regular order. Dispensing with regular order, however, should be the exception rather than the rule. Regrettably, that has not been the case in this Congress on more than one occasion. And also regrettably is the fact that issues important to veterans, supported by committee Republicans and Democrats, are not being given fair consideration. This was seen most notably during our last markup when a little used procedural tactic were employed to prevent two minority amendments from being debated and voted on. 
Mr. Chairman, never once did I or Jeff Miller before me use those same tactics during the eight years preceding your chairmanship. If the then Democratic minority members offered amendments, even on unrelated matters, we held votes on those amendments. Some of those votes were tough, but the, uh, the operating assumption was that they were offered in good faith and merited consideration. Regardless, my minority colleagues and I wrote or have spoken multiple times to you subsequent to the July 19 markup, Mr. Chairman, requesting in the scheduling of legislative hearings and markups on issues of critical importance to veterans we're here to serve. Those issues range from removing barriers to accessing mental health services created by Second Amendment restrictions, protecting children from predatory child care providers, and preventing veteran suicide. We have not been given the courtesy of responses to these letters. Mr. Chairman, I understand from your staff that we're having another markup in this committee on October 29th. Before then, I implore you to right this ship and to heed the minority's request to collaborate and have our proposals, many of which are in fact bipartisan, debated on their merits and voted up or down. One bill that should be without a doubt be on the markup agenda is H.R. 3495, the IMPROVE Act. The IMPROVE Act is a bipartisan bill that is sponsored by two veterans, this committee's own General Bergman and Congresswoman Chrissy Houlihan from Pennsylvania. To date, the IMPROVE Act has 140 co-sponsors, including 64 Democrats, several from this committee. Most importantly, it addresses perhaps the most serious issues veterans facing today, the national suicide crisis. VA released its most recent suicide data just a few weeks ago, and it tragically reaffirmed that 22 of our nation's service members, veterans, and never federally activated members of the National Guard and Reserve die by suicide each and every day. Mr. Chairman, you have made preventing suicide the priority issue in your chairmanship, and I commend you and wholeheartedly support you in that effort. Yet calls for the IMPROVE Act to be considered have thus far gone unanswered. Can we have your commitment today that the IMPROVE Act will be on the agenda for the October 29 markup? Uh, Ranking Member Rowe, uh, you have my commitment that the IMPROVE Act will be on the agenda. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I look forward to uh, discussing the IMPROVE Act further in the next few weeks and hope that we'll be able to discuss other important proposals that the minority have requested action on then as well. Uh, with that, I yield back. Thank you. You're welcome. So I now call up uh, H.R. 4625. H.R. 4625 to amend Title 38, United States Code, to require that educational institutions abide by certain principles. As Without objection, the first reading is dispensed with. The committee will now proceed to the consideration of H.R. 4625. And I recognize myself to offer an amendment in the nature of a substitute. The clerk will designate the amendment in the nature of the substitute. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 4625 offered by Mr. Takano of California. Strike all after the enacting clause and insert the following. Section 1, short title, table of contents. So the text was circulated in advance pursuant to committee rules without objection. The first reading is dispensed with and the substitute will be considered as original text for the purposes of amendment. I'll now recognize myself five, for five minutes to uh, discuss the ANS. This amendment in the nature of a substitute to Congressman Levin's Protect the GI Bill Act is bipartisan legislation incorporating Congressman Villarakis's Student Veteran Empowerment Act, Congresswoman Lee's Forever GI Bill Class Evaluation Act, Congresswoman Davis's uh, Re Reserve and Guard GI Bill Housing Fairness Act, and Congressman Foster's GI Bill Education Fairness Act. Uh, this amendment in the nature of a substitute protects student veterans from predatory institutions that seek to defraud veterans and reduces red tape that can unfairly place burdens on student veterans. Specifically, this ANS provides more authority to state approving agencies, or SAAs, which approve and disapprove whether higher education institutions are eligible to receive federal funding from veteran educational benefits. The SAAs are the frontline defense against institutions who seek to defend, to, who seek to defraud service members, veterans, and their families. Unfortunately, SAAs are not currently empowered to target schools that show signs of insolvency, engage in deceptive representation and marketing, or potentially commit fraud. 
Currently, SAAs primarily ensure that schools file their compliance paperwork properly. This is a waste of their abilities and resources. This measure empowers SAAs to closely examine these schools more frequently, allowing them to protect student veterans, which was the historical basis for their formation. This ANS also prevents veterans from incurring debt from post-9-11 GI Bill overpayments by mandating that schools confirm veterans' enrollment each month and prohibiting late payment charges uh, to students receiving GI Bill benefits. According to a Government Accountability Office report, in fiscal year 2014, VA made approximately $416 million in overpayments to veterans in about 6,000 schools. This meant about one in four veterans received an overpayment resulting in unexpected debt to student veterans. Now this is an injustice we cannot allow to perpetuate. This legislation also includes a technical correction for how spouses of service members in the Reserve and National Guard receive post 9-11 GI Bill housing allowance. Currently, the spouse of a Guard or Reserve member on active duty orders cannot collect BAH because the Guard or Reserve member receives BAH while on active duty for more than 30 days. A Guard or Reserve member on active duty for less than 30 days does not qualify for BAH. However, his, his or her spouse will be unable to collect post-9-11 GI Bill BAH. Now, this is not what Congress intended. This technical correction uh, including the bill, ensures that spouses of Guard and Reserve members continue to receive their post-9-11 GI Bill BAH in these instances. Finally, this ANS clarifies who is eligible for the transfer of post-9-11 GI Bill benefits. Currently, service members can transfer benefits to either their spouse, child, or both, but does not specify whether service members and veterans can transfer their benefits to foster children or adopted children. This aligns the law with the Department of Defense policy that permits minor dependents, including foster and adopted children, to receive these benefits. Now, I want to applaud the uh, Economic Opportunity Subcommittee's efforts to negotiate this legislation to improve the bill, to improve the GI Bill, and protect the students who use it. This uh, amendment in the nature of substitute is supported by Veterans Education Success, the Student Veterans Association, and the National Association of State Approving Agencies. And I urge each of you to support this amendment in the nature of substitute to H.R. 4625. The ANS shall now be considered as read for amendment and open for amendments at any point. Is there any discussion on the ANS? Uh, Dr. Rowe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I support this amendment in the nature of a substitute and thank Representative Levin for the bipartisan nature that he and Representative Bill Arrakis have used <laughs> to move this legislation forward. This amendment in the nature of a substitute includes the text of Representative Bill Arrakis' Bill H.R. 4085, the Student Veteran Empowered Act, and other important provisions that would provide greater oversight for the GI Bill approved schools, help avoid school closures, and reduce overpayment of the GI Bill funds to schools and students. I'm I am especially pleased that the amendment in the nature of a substitute builds upon our work in the forever GI Bill to provide restoration of GI Bill entitlement to eligible students whose schools have closed before they were able to complete their program. This will help students who are negatively impacted by school closures get back on track and complete their degrees. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for including this bill on today's agenda, and I, it has my full support, and I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member Rowe. Uh, Mr. Levin, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Ticano, for including the Protect the GI Bill Act in today's markup. Uh, my legislation ensures that student veterans receive the information they need to make informed decisions when selecting an institution of higher education. This includes the cost of attendance and how much their benefits cover, the length of program, licensure requirements, and student outcomes. State approving agencies, or SAAs, will be empowered to act against schools that fail to provide this information, including by suspending new enrollments. The bill also prevents the VA and SAAs from approving deceptive schools that misrepresent themselves while recruiting and enrolling students. The amendment in the nature of a substitute further improves the bill by incorporating legislation from Subcommittee Ranking Member Bill Arrakis and Representatives Lee, 
Davis, and Foster. This includes provisions strengthening accreditation requirements, targeting problematic institutions for risk-based surveys, and restoring benefits for students that experience a school closure. I want to thank my colleagues for these important contributions. This bipartisan package will help protect veterans' GI Bill benefits, as well as the time and efforts they invest into their education. I urge my colleagues to support the Protect the GI Bill Act, and I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Levin. Uh, Ms. Lee, I, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. I'd like to thank you, Chairman Takano, for your leadership and for including my bipartisan legislation, the Student Veteran Protection Act, and today's package of bills that provide much needed updates to the GI Bill, and Chair Levin for considering this legislation as necessary to protect the GI Bill legislation. This is common sense bipartisan legislation. The Student Veteran Protection Act changes how overpayments are handled by the VA, schools, and veterans by making those overpayments the responsibility of schools, not veterans. By doing so, schools would return the overpayments directly to the VA instead of sending those payments on to student veterans who would then be responsible for reimbursing the VA. By shifting the financial bur burden of the VA GI Bill overpayment from the student veteran to schools, not only does this help remove an unfair obstacle on our veterans' road to academic success, but it will save taxpayers an estimated $120 million over 10 years by cutting red tape and simplifying the GI Bill overpayment process. I want to reiterate what I've said before. We need to make things easier, not harder, for our student veterans to succeed. That is why I support the amendment. I urge my colleagues to support the amendment in the nature of a substitute and the efforts of this legislation to simplify the GI Bill's ability to work for student veterans in Nevada and across this great nation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Lee, and thank you, uh, Mr. Levin, you both for uh, your contributions to this, uh, to this legislation. Um, Mr. Mr. Barac Baracus? Yes, please, thank you. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 4625 at the desk. Uh, the clerk will designate the amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of the a substitute. The text was circulated in advance pursuant to committee rules. Mr. Baracus, you recognize for five minutes in support of your amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I will speak to my amendment in a moment, but first I want to express my support for the underlying bill and the ANS. Uh, this ANS is the byproduct of several hearings and bipartisan legislation that I've worked on with Chairman Levin uh, to improve oversight of the GI Bill and protect student veterans in case of school closures. I'm proud that the ANS includes almost all of the provisions for my bill, H.R. 4085, the Student Veteran Empowerment Act. Again, I want to thank the chairman, Chairman Levin, uh, Chairman uh, Takano, and of course the ranking member, uh, Dr. Rowe. My bill is designed to limit overpayment of GI Bill funds to students and schools, improve oversight of GI Bill programs by VA and state approving agencies, and most importantly, extend the restoration of entitlement for student veterans impacted by school closure to all students. The restoration of entitlement section extends benefits we first provided to a limited number of students in the Forever GI Bill and is critical to ensure that students' entitlement is not lost or wasted when a school closes or is disapproved uh, before completion of the program. I want to thank veteran service organizations for their input and advice while drafting my bill, especially the Veterans Education Success, uh, Student Veterans of America, and the Veterans of Foreign Wars. Mr. Chairman, while I'm pleased that we are considering this ANS today, I'm concerned that one important piece to provide uh, to prevent overpayments has been left out. Uh, my original bill included a provision that would require a student veteran to verify monthly their enrollment at a GI Bill program. This certification would be done online and would simply require the student veterans to verify the VA's information on the number of classes they are taking is accurate. 
My amendment to the ANS simply adds this requirement back into the text and would require that if a student has not verified their attendance for two consecutive months, again, for two consecutive months, then they would not receive a living allowance payment until this certification is made. This provision was originally crafted from a recommendation by a GAO in their 2015 report on reducing GI Bill overpayments. GAO recommended that to prevent overpayment from enrollment delays, VA should, and I quote, implement a cost-effective way to allow post-9-11 GI Bill beneficiaries to verify their enrollment status each month and require monthly reporting. This verification would allow the student to be the second check to ensure that the school or VA have not made an error in the number of classes they're taking. This would also allow the student to quickly know and plan for the amount they are going to receive each month which allows them to plan their own monthly expenses based on this verification. I understand some may be concerned about the verification overburdening students. I acknowledge that under my amendments, students will have to take a few minutes, a few minutes once a month to verify their enrollment. However, I believe there's a small price to pay to avoid the potential for thousands of dollars in preventable overpayments that could take students months, uh, again, uh, the students months uh, to pay back, and we don't want that. Ultimately, this provision is for the protection of the student veteran. Mr. Chairman, veterans groups agree, as I have received unofficial support for this policy from several veterans groups. VA, VA also provided supportive views of monthly verification for the post-9-11 GI Bill benefits and we had uh, adopted those suggestions by delaying the effective date and making minor tweaks to the original language. Monthly verification of enrollment is already required for students using the Mon Montgomery GI Bill and has been for years, so this is not a new or burdensome concept for VA. As I said earlier, I support the underlying bill and the ANS and simply ask that members support my perfecting amendment to ensure that we do all that we can to prevent costly overpayments from uh, occurring. And I really appreciate the cooperation, uh, uh, the bipartisan support, and uh, I, I really enjoy working with the, the subcommittee chairman, and uh, we're doing good work for our heroes. So uh, with that, I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Barakas, for your amendment. Uh, is there any further debate on the amendment to the uh, to the amendment in the nature of a substitute. Uh, uh, Dr. Rowe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I support uh, Representative Belarakis's amendment. The goal of the underlying bill is to support uh, student veterans and avoid school closures and prevent overpayments. This amendment simply uh, implements a government accountability recommendation from 2015 to require that student veterans monthly certify their attendance. By doing so, we would add an additional check to complement the monthly certification of students' attendance required by the underlying amendment in the nature of a substitute. Student veterans are the best position to know what classes they are taking and no longer taking, and we should be doing what we can to ensure that VA's record of their attendance is correct. When mistakes are made, we create unnecessary overpayments, and Representative Bill Arrakis is correct that those overpayments would be a significantly larger burden on student veterans than the 30 seconds it would take them to certify their enrollment and avoid overpayments in the first place. Monthly verification has been required for students using the Montgomery GI Bill for decades. To acknowledge the limited burden this process would place on students, Representative Bill Arrakis' amendment would not end the payment of the monthly housing allowance until the veteran had failed to certify their attendance for two consecutive months. This is a reasonable compromise amendment that is supported by GAO, by several VSOs, and not opposed by VA. And um, just, as, uh, the, just as an addendum, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, the, the Forever GI Bill is probably one of the best things that we've done uh, since we've been here, some of the best work we've done. We have, what, $1.5, $1.6 trillion in student loan debt. This is a phenomenal benefit. Um, and I know there are veteran members here. How many of us have used the GI Bill? I did in 1975, and, and I'm forever grateful to this day. It was $300 a month. 
for two years. That's what I got. And, and to this day, I was a young, young Army officer, just gotten out of the military, had a two-year-old and one on the way, and had no money. And this was very, very helpful to me at that time in my life. And, and I think probably one of the best benefits we have done, and this just cleans it up a little bit. And, um, and now our veterans can expect to graduate with, with their degree, something they've earned, and have no debt and be able to start out debt-free. It's a phenomenal benefit. And I, I applaud this committee for having done this work. Now yield back. Uh before I make uh, my formal comments, Dr. Rowe, I, I know this, uh, the Jafarba GI Bill was work that was done under your chairmanship, and so I want to commend uh, the bipartisan work we did uh, under your chairmanship and under your leadership and as the, uh, uh, on the bipartisanship, uh, bipartisan basis with the committee. Uh, and uh, I'm delighted that we're able to move forward and uh, set better conditions for the forever GI Bill uh, to succeed. And as of course, it's called the forever GI Bill because if uh, there's no expiration date um, on uh, the benefit. Well, there actually is one. Uh, that's when you die. <laughs> <laughs> there is an expiration date. In this lifetime. Uh, uh, well, not quite true because you can actually, tr you can transfer it to your children. You can transfer it to your children. So, got you on that one. Uh, so, you can actually transfer it uh, to a dependent, uh, to a spouse. Um, and uh, because many of our service members find that they uh, can gain an education uh, through tuition assistance, and I actually think that's the smartest use of this benefit, is to utilize tuition assistance while you're in the service, uh, get your degrees, uh, and then be able to pass this on to your children or a spouse. Um, and, let me all, and the other important ingredient uh, to this legislation today are the SAAs. Uh, strengthening the SAAs. I know, Mr. Levin, uh, you have deep knowledge and passion for uh, improving the accountability of what programs um, are allowed. And the best place to do that is at the state level, uh, where the states are empowered uh, and supported uh, in approving and disapproving programs. We, don't, we want our veterans, we want our veterans using taxpayer dollars uh, in in good, decent programs, that they're not fraudulent programs, they're not uh, thin uh, or uh, 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 non-substantive programs. We want good programs that actually prepare people to work for us and prepare them uh, for academic life if, that, if they're choosing to go the academic route. So this amendment to you uh, from Congressman Wet Villarakis further addresses overpayments of educational benefits by bringing student veterans into uh, class enrollment verification. In a 2015 GAO report, it was found that over $400 million was lost every year due to overpayments, impacting one in four veterans uh, at about 6,000 schools. And we don't want to have to see the VA have to claw back stuff. That is always a, a painful thing. And frankly, if it's because of the VA's own inability to track stuff, we shouldn't claw it back, in my opinion. Uh, my NS includes language from Congresswoman Lee which also addresses overpayments, and, and the amendment uh, from Congressman Villarocas further strengthened those efforts by adding another check to ensure benefits are properly dispersed. I support this amendment, but I, don't, I do want to express concern with VA's ability to implement a new electronic system to administer this enrollment check. I hope we can continue to work on this issue in the future. I support the Villarocas amendment. Is there any further debate on the amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? Uh, if not, the question is on the Bill of Rockets Amendment to the Amendment and Nature of a Substitute to H.R. 4625. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Say no. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it, and the Amendment to the Amendment and the Nature of a Substitute is agreed to without objection. The motion to reconsider is laid on the table. Is there any further debate on the NS? If not, the question is on the Amendment uh, in the Nature of the Substitute to H.R. 4625. All those in favor say aye. Any opposed? Say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment, to, uh, and the amendment is agreed to. Without objection, the, moment, uh, the motion is laid. Um, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. The question is now on agreeing to HR 4625 as amended. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and HR 4625 
as amended is agreed to and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. I now recognize uh, Ranking Member Rowe for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that H.R. 4625, as amended, be reported favorably to the House of Representatives. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, say no. In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it, and the motion is agreed to. And without objection, the staff uh, is, allow, uh, is, uh, is authorized to make necessary and technical, necessary technical and conforming changes uh, to, the committee, to the committee amendments. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I pursuant to House Rule 11, Clause 2, I give notice of intent to file minority or supplemental additional or dissenting views. I yield back. Duly noted. Without objection. Without objection, uh, duly noted. Uh, I now call up H.R. 3749. H.R. 3749. Without objection, the first reading is dispensed with. The committee will now proceed to consideration of H.R. 3749, and I recognize Mr. Cisneros to offer an amendment in the nature of a substitute. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment in the, in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3749 at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment in the nature of a substitute. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to The text HR was circulated in advance pursuant to committee rules. Without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with, and the substitute will be considered as original text for the purposes of amendment. Mr. Cisneros, you are recognized for five minutes in support of your amendment. Thank you, Chairman Takano, Ranking Member Rowe. It is an honor to offer the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3749, the Legal Services for Homeless Veterans Act, a bill introduced by, by my colleague, friend, and fellow veteran, Rep Panetta. Veteran homelessness is a national epidemic that significant, significantly impacts veterans in my district. As such, I was proud to join Mr. Panetta and some of our congr congressional for caucus, or, I'm sorry, our Congressional Four Country Caucus colleagues on this committee to introduce a strong bipartisan bill to help veterans at risk of homelessness. No veteran should be living on the streets. After the sacrifices they have made in service of our country, we must do all that we can to ensure no veteran goes homeless. We in this committee have worked hard to support existing housing, employment, and other supportive services that are available to those in need. We are missing a critical component to ending homelessness. The reality is legal issues such as bad credit, unpaid child support, unpaid fines, and tickets, warrants, and criminal records can often contribute to homelessness. In fact, according to the Department of Veterans Affairs Project Committee Homelessness Assessment, local education and networking groups, unresolved legal problems comprised of half veterans' top 10 unmet needs for nine years in a row. The Legal Services for Homeless Veterans Act works to solve this issue by directing the VA sec Secretary to provide grants to organizations that provide legal services to homeless veterans and veterans at risk for homelessness. Resources necessary to help veterans resolve legal issues and get back on their feet so they can get back to being an integral part of the community and the country. The amendment I am offering today will help build and expand on these principles by incorporating related legislation. Specifically, the amendment will incorporate portions of Homeless Veterans Legal Service Act introduced by Rep. Betty and Rep. Uh, Stivers related to legal services for veterans. Additionally, as women veterans are the fastest growing segment of the homeless veteran population, this bill incorporates language from Rep. Wild's Improving Legal Services for Female Veterans Act and Rep. Levin's Housing for Women's Veterans Act to ensure a portion of the funds allocated into this bill and the support of service for veterans families programs will support women veterans. As homelessness is a multifaceted issue, it is important to approach solutions from a holistic approach by addressing legal barriers as well as the unique obstacles that women veterans face. I would like to again share my sincere appreciation for my colleagues, Rep. Betty, Rep. Wild, Rep. Levin, and particularly Rep. Panetta for their work on this legislation. This is a common sense bipartisan package of bills that has been endorsed by over 40 organizations, including the National Coalition for Homeless Veterans, the American Legion of Disabled American Veterans, uh, IAVA, the VVA, and the American Bar Association. I urge my colleagues on this committee to join me in support of the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3749, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Cisneros. Uh, over the past decade, uh, Congress and uh, pres presidential administrations have prioritized ending, ending veteran homelessness. However, the rates of veteran homelessness have, have, uh, haven't fallen. Uh, while, while the rates of veteran homelessness have fallen, 
Uh, even one veteran without shelter is unacceptable. Uh, this committee is committed to preventing veterans from becoming homeless by providing services to prevent homelessness, improving educational benefits so that veterans can obtain good jobs, and promoting policies that give uh, preferences for hiring veterans and for veteran-owned small businesses. However, if veterans become homeless, it is our duty to give them all the assistance they need. According to VA and the Project Challenge, and Project Challenge, um, and the Project Challenge survey, legal services are one of the top unmet needs for homeless veterans. The Cisneros Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3749 directly addresses that need. Uh, this ANS contains Congressman Panetta's legislation and Congresswoman Beatty's legislation, which would require VA to make grants or enter into cooperative agreements to eligible entities that provide legal services to homeless veterans and veterans at risk for homelessness. VA would be required to, uh, required to consult with organizations that have experience providing services to homeless veterans to establish these criteria and requirements, and these grants or cooperative agreements would only be available to highly rated public or non profit entities. This ANS also incorporates uh, a bill uh, introduced by Representative Wild to direct a portion of legal services for homeless veterans to homeless women veterans. And as we know, women veterans are the fastest growing uh, population of homeless veterans. And I thank Representative Wild for focusing on this issue. Finally, this ANS includes the Housing for Women Veterans Act by, uh, introduced by Congressman Levin. His legislation requires that at least 10% of the Supportive Services for Veterans uh, Families grant program go to assisting homeless veterans with children. The SSVF program has been one of the most effective tools to address veteran homelessness since its creation by President Obama, and I thank this administration and Congress for supporting it. And I want to thank Representative Le Levin and Representative Villarakis for their leadership on the Economic Opportunity Subcommittee. They have already held two field hearings this year on veteran homelessness, and today we see the result of their work. And our, wor and our committee will continue working on more homelessness issues uh, this Congress. Uh, this ANS, or the underlying legislation, is supported by over 40 organizations, including the American Legion, Disabled American Veterans, uh, Vietnam Veterans of America, IAVA, and the National Coalition uh, for Homeless Veterans. And without objection, the list of uh, supporting organizations, and I have this huge long list here, uh, uh, will be entered into the record. And I urge each of you to support the Cisneros Amendment in the nature of the substitute to H.R. 3749. Uh, the ANS shall now be considered as read for amendment and open for amendment at any point. Is there any further debate on the Cisneros Amendment? Uh, Dr. Rowe. Just very briefly, Mr. Chairman, while I'm not opposed to the amendment in the nature of a substitute or the underlying goal of legislation, I do have some concerns about the approach we're taking today. While we may agree on the need to provide additional funding to organizations that provide legal services to homeless veterans, such funding is already authorized under the Supportive Services for Veterans and Families program, the SSVF program. I'm also concerned that the amendment in the nature of a substitute does not include an authorization cap to limit the amount of medical services, service dollars that can be spent on this new, and some would say duplicative authority. That being said, I support the goal of this amendment in the nature of a substitute and will not oppose it. I hope that before this provision becomes law, we can work together to address some of my concerns and ensure that we're not being unnecessarily duplicative in our quest to support homeless and at-risk veterans. And just yesterday, we voted, I think, unanimously on the House floor uh, for a per diem for our children uh, of homeless veterans. And when I first came here, I think Mr. Peterson uh, and probably Mr. Bilirakis were the only two of us on the committee um, in 2009, when General Shinseki was the chairman, was the secretary, there are over 100,000 homeless veterans in this country, unbelievable. Um, I mean, just a staggering number. Um, there are only three cities in my state, or four now, that have more people than that. And I know that 10 percent of I visited uh, uh, last when I was the chairman in Los Angeles, where Los Angeles County, and Mr. Cisneros, thank you for, and you and Mr. Panetta for bringing this up, uh, 10 percent of the homeless veterans in America are in one county. So it's a huge problem. I think the last number I saw, which is, I agree with the chairman, 100 percent, one is one too many. Uh, but but the, 
country has made great progress. It's less than 39,000. That's still a lot of people uh, on the street. And I, I want to commend this committee uh, for the work it's done in trying to reduce this. I think it's shameful in a country as wealthy as we are, as much bounty as we have, to have veterans living on the street. So I, I thank everyone involved in this, and um, Mr. Levin, your leadership, and, and Mr. Cisneros, yours. And with that, I yield back. Is there any further uh, debate on the Cisneros Amendment? Mr. Levin, five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chair Takano, and, and thanks to the ranking member as well for those kind words. Um, thank you for offering this amendment in the nature of a substitute, which includes my legislation, the Housing for Women Veterans Act. Uh, as has been said, homelessness is a serious issue uh, for veterans uh, in my district and across the nation. And this is particularly true for women veterans. Uh, at our Economic Opportunity Subcommittee hearings, we've learned about the unique challenges that homeless women veterans uh, face. Uh, this was true both uh, at the hearing in, in my district in Oceanside, California, as well as when we went to uh, Tampa, Florida, Mr. Bilirakis's district. Uh, women are the fastest growing population of homeless individuals, having more than doubled since 2006, and this bill will better address their needs. Uh, this legislation requires that at least $20 million each year under the Supportive Services for Veteran Families Program, or SSVF program, go to organizations with a focus on helping women veterans. It also requires the VA to analyze and report to Congress on the areas in which its homelessness programs are shortchanging women. I'm pleased that the underlying bill will also address veteran homelessness by providing much needed legal services related to housing, family law, income support, criminal defense, and discharge status. I strongly support the ANS and urge my colleagues to do so as well. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Levin. Is there any further uh, debate on the Cisneros Amendment? If not, the question is on the Cisneros Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3749. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the Cisneros uh, uh, ANS is agreed to. And without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. The question is now on agreeing to H.R. 3749 as, amendment, uh, as amended. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and H.R. 3749 as amended is agreed to, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. Uh, I recognize Ranking Member Rowe for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that H.R. 3749 as amended be reported favorably to the House of Representatives. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the motion is agreed to, without objection. Uh, staff is authorized to make necessary technical and conforming changes. Mr. Chairman, pursuant to House Rule 11, Clause 2, I give notice of intent to file minority of supplemental and additional or dissenting views. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, I now call up H.R. 4613. H.R. 4613 to direct the Secretary. Without objection, the first reading is dispensed with. This legislation introduced by Representatives Rose and Cisneros will improve the transparency at VA. Surprisingly, the Department of Veterans Affairs does not currently provide public access to many of its reports that are mandated by Congress. Rather than place its reports on its website, VA will often only transmit its reports to a few congressional committees, such as uh, House and Senate Committees on Veterans Affairs. By contrast, the VA Office of Inspector General posts its reports online within three days of completion. Public access to all VA reports will allow veterans and the, public, uh, and the public access to critical information about agency activities and the effectiveness of services. It would also improve accountability. The bill is supported by the American Legion, Veterans of Foreign Wars, and Disabled American Veterans. The bill will be considered um, uh, as read and open to any point, open to amendment at any point. Is there debate on H.R. 4613? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Uh, the clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 4613 offered by Mr. Rowe of Tennessee on page 2, line 10. The text was 10. circulated in advance pursuant to community rules. 
Dr. Rowe, you recognize for five minutes in support of your amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This rows and rows get pretty confusing for people here. Row, yeah, it's like <laughs> <laughs> this bill was introduced uh, on October 4th and was rushed to markup without any semblance of regular order. I understand from staff discussions that no other committee has directed a federal agency to publish legislatively mandated reports, so this is a novel policy proposal. I believe that a legislative hearing on this bill is warranted. In the absence of one, my amendment would address three major concerns. First, I do not think that it is in the best use of VA's time to publish old reports that may have little or no value, so my amendment would clarify that requirement for VA to post legislatively mandated reports would apply prospectively, number one. Secondly, as written, VA would be required to post the report within three days of transmission to Congress. My amendment would expand the time frame to 30 days to give Congress time to review the report before VA publishes it. Mr. Chairman, as you know, the Government Accountability Office gives requesters the right to request a 30-day embargo prior to publishing its report, so this amendment would align with GAO's process. Finally, my amendment would clarify that Congress can, at the time of requesting the report, exempt it from publication. The bill, as introduced, would provide a, quote, a recipient committee or subcommittee, end quote, the opportunity to request that VA not publish a report. As written, the mechanics of the, that process are unclear, so my amendment would address that ambiguity and require Congress to decide whether VA should publish a report at, at the time it mandates the report. Hope that all committee members will support my amendment and once again uh, request, Mr. Chairman, that we return to regular order so we can better understand the impact of legislation before members are asked to vote in favor of forwarding it to the full House. And with that, I yield back. Well, thank you, Dr. Rowe. Uh, this amendment does clarify that if Congress requires a congressionally mandated report uh, that remain uh, that remain now in public, that VA must indicate it on its website that the report was completed and submitted to Congress, and that Congress determined the report uh, should not be made public, and I, I do support this amendment. Uh, is there any further debate on the Roe Amendment? Uh, if not, the question is on the Roe Amendment to H.R. 4613. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the Roe Amendment is agreed to, and while objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. Uh, the question now is on agreeing to H.R. 4613 as amended. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and H.R. 4613 as amended is agreed to, and while objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. I now recognize Ranking Member Rowe for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that H.R. 4613, as amended, be reported favorably to the House of Representatives. All those in favor of Mr. Rowe's, uh, Dr. Rowe's motion, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the motion is agreed to. Without objection, the staff is authorized to make necessary technical and conforming changes in the committee's amendments. Mr. Chairman, pursuant to House Rule 11, Clause 2, I give notice of intent to file a minority or supplemental additional or dissenting views. Without objection, so ordered. I call up H.R. 4477. H.R. 4477. Without objection, the first reading is dispensed with. The committee will now proceed to the consideration of H.R. 4477, and I recognize myself to offer an amendment in the nature of a substitute. The clerk will designate the amendment in the nature of a substitute. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. So text was circulated in advance pursuant to committee rules. Without objection, the first reading is dispensed with, and the substitute will be considered as original text for the purposes of amendment. I now recognize myself for five minutes to discuss the amendment. First of all, I'd like to thank Congressman Pappas and General Bergman for introducing the Reducing High Risk to Veteran Services Act. This bill requires VA to develop a plan to address the Government Accountability Office's placement of the Veteran Health Administration and VA acquisition management on the high-risk list. Every Congress, GAO, re releases its high-risk list of federal government programs most vulnerable to fraud, waste, abuse, or mismanagement. In 2015, the Veterans Health Administration, the largest health care system in the country, was added to the high-risk list. It remains on the list this Congress. 
VA acquisition management was added to the high risk list this Congress because of inefficient acquisition funding and staffing resources and numerous contracting challenges. VA's acquisition management challenge make the challenges make the Veterans Health Administration more vulnerable to fraud, waste, mismanagement, and abuse because of its role in medical supply procurement and medical facility construction, both vital to VA's ability to serve veterans and provide medical care. The bill has the support of the American Legion, Veterans of Foreign Wars, and the Disabled American Vets. I urge each of you to support this ANS so that we can hold VA accountable for taking steps or failing to take steps to remove these vital programs from the high-risk list. The amendment will be considered as read and open to amendment at any point. Is there discussion on the NS to the to HR 4477? Mr. Dr. Rowe? Very briefly, Mr. Chairman. Well, I, was, I do support your amendment and uh, I appreciate you including Mr. Banks' bill. But I would like to point out that this is one of the bills on today's agenda that has not received any regular order from which I believe the bill could have benefited. And that I yield back. Uh, is there any further debate on the ANS? General Bergman, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I appreciate you including H.R. 4477, a bill introduced by ONI Subcommittee Chairman uh, Chris Pappas that I was proud to co-lead. Every two years, GAO publishes its high-risk list, identifying those activities that are considered high-risk due to their vulnerabilities to fraud, waste, abuse, and mismanagement. GAO added managing risks and improving VA health care to its list in 2015, and it remains there today. In 2019, GAO added VA acquisition management. In May, the Comptroller General of the United States testified before the ONI subcommittee regarding the Department's efforts to address GAO recommendations. Comptroller General Dodaro testified during the hearing, quote, I want to emphasize hardly any area in the high-risk area gets off the list without sustained congressional oversight as well and action by the Congress. The engagement by the Congress is absolutely critical to the success of agencies coming off the high risk, end quote. The intent of this bill is to focus VA on its efforts to remove these two programs from GAO's high risk list and give Congress the information needed to provide sustained congressional oversight, which the Comptroller General said was absolutely critical to the success of removing programs from the high risk list. I want to thank Chairman Takano for his amendment in the nature of a substitute, which would incorporate provisions of H.R. 698, a bill introduced by Representative Banks. The ANS would also require VA to report on its efforts to implement GAO's priority recommendations for VA, as well as GAO's annual list of the top 30 open recommendations. I support the ANS, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, uh, General Bergman. Is there any further debate on the NS? Mr. Pappas, five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And I want to thank Ranking Member Bergman for his comments and for introducing this legislation with me. Uh, we base this bill on findings from a spring hearing held by our Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee. Um, as has been mentioned, every two years, the GAO releases its high-risk list of federal government programs most vulnerable to fraud, waste, abuse, mismanagement. And unfortunately, this latest GAO report features the Department of Veterans Affairs prominently. GAO was first included. Uh, included VA healthcare on this list in 2015, acquisition management added this year. And during that spring hearing, we learned that VA is moving much too slowly in fixing these and many other problems identified by GAO. Clearly, it's time for action. This bill does just that. It requires greater accountability and transparency as VA attempts to address the problems identified by GAO. And most importantly, VA would have to establish a robust plan for addressing these priorities and submit it to Congress. So again, I want to express my appreciation to Ranking Member Bergman and to you, Mr. Chairman, and Ranking Member Rowe for their support of this legislation, and I yield back. Uh, th uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Pappas. Uh, is there any further debate on the ANS? If not, the question is on the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 4477. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, say no. 
In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the ANS is agreed to. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. The question is now on agreeing to H.R. 4477 as amended. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed uh, say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and H.R. 4477 is amended, is agreed to, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. I now recognize uh, Ranking Member Rowe for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that H.R. 4477, as amended, be reported favorably to the House of Representatives. Uh, uh, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, say no. Uh, in the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the motion is agreed to. Without objection, the staff is authorized to make necessary technical and conforming changes. Mr. Chairman, pursuant to House Rule 11, Clause 2, I give notice of intent to file a minority or supplemental additional or dissenting views. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, I now call up H.R. 4162. H.R. 4162. Without objection, the first reading is, dispen is dispensed with. The committee will now proceed to the consideration of H.R. 4162, and I recognize Dr. Rowe to offer an amendment in the nature of a substitute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment in the nature of a substitute at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment in the nature of a substitute. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 41. The text was circulated in advance pursuant to committee rules. Without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with, and the substitute <laughs> will be considered as original text for the purposes of amendment. Dr. Rowe, you are recognized for five minutes in support of your amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Under current law, service members are eligible for two educational programs, the Montgomery GI Bill or the post-9-11 GI Bill. Under the Montgomery GI Bill, service members automatically have $100 a month deducted from their pay for the first 12 months of their service for a total of $1,200. Uh, they may opt out of the Montgomery GI Bill, but they must make that election during the first two weeks of basic training or boot camp. Any of us have ever been to boot camp, that's not a good time to make a, de a decision. <laughs> After 100 shots and anyway. <laughs> However, for most service members who complete their initial enlistment, they're eligible for post-9-11 GI Bill, which does not require the $1,200 payment. As more and more service members leave active duty, fewer and fewer are choosing to use the Montgomery GI Bill because for most participants, the post-9-11 GI Bill is a better education benefit. Student Veterans of America recently testified on VA data that shows between FY14 and FY18, 94% of students choose the post-9-11 GI Bill over the Montgomery GI Bill. General Bergman's bill addresses this issue by delaying the decision on opting out of the Montgomery GI Bill until 180 days after the service member's initial enlistment. This extra time would give them the opportunity to weigh the pros and the cons of each GI Bill and decide which program is right for them outside the stress of basic training. And a first sergeant in your face, I might add. Uh, General Bergman's bill would also responsibly sunset the Montgomery GI Bill program for new enlistees in fiscal year 2030. This landmark benefits program has been in place since 1984. However, with the enactment of the post-9-11 GI Bill, the changes that were made last Congress in the forever GI Bill, it's time to sunset it to provide clarity and reduce confusion for service members on the, which program is right for them. Those who have already gained eligibility for the Montgomery GI Bill would not be impacted by this sunset. My amendment in the nature of a substitute also includes the text of General Bergman's bill and the text of my bill, H.R. 3608, which would extend in-state tuition benefits to more veterans. The 2014 Choice Act required for public schools to be eligible for GI Bill programs they must charge veterans who are within three years of their discharge in-state tuition rates regardless of whether they meet the state's residency requirements. This requirement was waivable, but to date, all states and public schools are complying with the law. Last Congress, I was proud to co-author the Forever GI Bill, which among other improvements to the post-9-11 GI Bill eliminated requirements that a veteran's 36 month of GI Bill benefits expire 15 years after their last discharge from active duty. Now that, uh, now that this change has become law, it, does, it doesn't make sense to require that veterans be within three years of their discharge to receive in-state tuition rates if they have their entire lives to use their GI Bill benefits. Therefore, my amendment in the nature of a substitute eliminates the three-year rule and ensures that in-state tuition rates are extended to all veterans. 27 states and territories have already eliminated the three-year rule, 
which indicates to me that this change would not be cumbersome for the remaining states. The Congressional Budget Office has provided me with an informal estimate that my amendment in the nature of a substitute is budget neutral as, as the in-state tuition provision offsets uh, the proposed changes to the Montgomery GI Bill. I thank the Chairman for bringing this bill forward and urge adoption of my amendment in the nature of a substitute. Now yield back. Thank you, Dr. Rowe, and I now recognize myself for five minutes. I'd like to thank Dr. Rowe for offering this uh, amendment in the nature of a substitute and uh, General Bergman for his work on, on his bill, the GI Bill Planning Act of 2019. When our service members enlist in the armed forces, they must decide to participate in the Montgomery GI Bill program, an irrevocable decision that they make uh, during boot camp or basic training. And I understand there's a feeling of some duress uh, during this time period. Um, uh, and this is a time when they usually do not have enough information, uh, our, meaning our service members, uh, to make informed decisions and are under a certain amount of stress. We encourage uh, service members to be informed consumers and make good choices. However, during basic training, it is difficult for new recruits to make those decisions when their focus is understandably elsewhere. When service members ask about GI Bill benefits during basic training, they're often given no more advice than, well, it depends on your situation. Uh, this usually leaves service members without the information uh, to understand their particular situation and without information to make an informed choice. This amendment in the nature of a substitute requires service members to make an election to use the Montgomery GI Bill six months after a recruit enters basic training. This will give them more time to call home, talk to educational advisors, and make more informed decisions about which educational benefits are the best for them. Uh, and this ANS also phases out the Montgomery GI Bill a program over 10 years, ending enrollment in the program uh, in 2029. However, it does not sunset the program, so every service member electing to participate and paying into the program uh, is still able to utilize it even after the election, uh, the ability to elect into the program ends in 2029. After 2029, service members will have uh, the more generous post 9-11 GI Bill available as their educational benefit which does not require them to pay into the program. I'm aware that in some cases it may be more financially advantageous for some service members and veterans to use the Montgomery GI Bill. I am committed to improving the post 9-11 GI Bill so that all service members and veterans have the same level of tangible benefits under one program and do not have to experience a loss of benefits when the Montgomery GI Bill is phased out. Our veteran service organizations have advocated for addressing the inequities in the Montgomery GI Bill uh, program for those veterans and veterans, uh, for those service members and veterans who paid into the program and never used their benefit and never received a refund of the money they paid into it. So I'm committed to identifying and addressing these inequalities and gaps and benefits over this 10-year phase-out periods so that every service member receives equal educational benefits. Finally, this legislation will also end concerns in the military and veteran community that the post 9-11 GI Bill could be repealed, forcing a return to the GI Bill, Mon uh, Montgomery GI Bill, where service members must pay for their educational benefits. Our country is still at war. We have service members enlisting who were not alive on September 11th, 2001. Congress should not be taking away this benefit simply because time has passed. I thank our Economic Opportunity Subcommittee for working together on this legislation, and I encourage each of you to support the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 4162. The ANS shall now be considered as read for amendment and open for amendment at any point. Is there debate on the Roe Amendment? If not, uh, the question is on the Roe Amendment in the nature of a substitute to 41, H.R. 4162. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say no. Uh, in the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the Roe Amendment in the nature of a substitute is agreed to, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. The question is now on agreeing to H.R. 4162 as amendment. As amended, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say no. 
Uh, in the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and H.R. 4162 as amended is agreed to, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. I now recognize Ranking Member Rowe for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that H.R. 4162 as amended be reported favorably to the House of Representatives. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the motion is agreed to. Without objection, the staff is authorized to make necessary technical and conforming changes. Uh, Mr. Bergman, you would like to make a comment before I... Could I speak for just a minute? Pardon me? Could I speak on my bill for just a minute, oh, Mr. Please. Chairman? Yes. You know, it's um, serendipity. 18 years ago today, by day, 16 October 2001, Jim Collins published his book, Good to Great. And uh, what in part of the essence of that book was that companies that really become great do three things every year. They evaluate that which they're doing that they need to keep doing, that which they're not doing that they need to start doing, and that which they're currently doing that they need to stop doing, the toughest one of the three. And I would suggest to you in listening to Dr. Rowe's amendment, and when we think about sunsetting the, the uh, Montgomery GI Bill, um, it is very appropriate, especially combined what is with uh, Chairman Ticano's comments about some of our servicemen and women serving today were not even born on 9-11. So for this committee uh, to do the kind of things that we're doing here for the veteran as opposed to the VA, there's a distinction there. This is the kind of thing that makes this committee one of the best bipartisan committees that we have here in Congress. And I just, I just wanted to thank my, my colleague, although I see she had to step out for a minute, but uh, Congresswoman Kathleen Rice for working with us on this bill because it makes the difference. And, was, and which was said earlier, you're looking eyeball to eyeball, in my case, with Staff Sergeant Dexter Mills, my DI, and you don't know which end is up, but they're going to tell you and they're going to tell you because they care for you in such a way that they want you to make the best decisions. But they're, they are going to put you under stress and duress, but for your own good, so you can survive in the fight. So I'm just glad to be part of this committee, and thanks for bringing the bill to the floor. Thank you, General Bergman. Uh, so uh, uh, I was about to say, uh, without objection, the staff is authorized to make necessary and uh, necessary technical and conforming changes uh, to the bill uh, that we've agreed to uh, send to the floor of the House. Uh, and uh, without objection, um, I authorize the staff to do that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, first of all, uh, General Bergman, I didn't know that a DI loved anybody, including themselves. <laughs> uh, pursuant to it's a different kind of love. <laughs> pursuant to House Rule 11, Clause 2, I give a notice of intent to file minority or supplemental additional or dissenting views. instructors. All right, I now call up H.R. 561. H.R. 561 to amend Title 38. The text 38. was circulated in advance pursuant to committee rules. Without objection, the first reading is dispensed with. Uh, this bill, sponsored by General Bergman and uh, Congresswoman Custer, would establish important oversight for VA small business contracting. Under current law, a small business contractor cannot give a subcontractor a subcontractor more than 50% of its contract work. The legislation requires veteran and service disabled veteran owned small businesses to certify that they are performing at least half of the work. It also requires VA to refer contractors violating or suspected of violating the law to the VA Inspector General for investigation. The legislation also establishes an oversight process and penalties for fraudulently claiming to comply with the law. This bill is supported by the American Legion. The House passed this legislation last Congress. I supported this bill last Congress, and I support it today. I urge each of you to vote yes on this bill. The bill will be considered as read and open to amendment any time. Is there a discussion on H.R. 561? General Bergman, five minutes. Again, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Rowe. I deeply appreciate the opportunity for my bill, H.R. 561, the Protecting Business Opportunities for Veterans Act of 2019 to be considered in today's markup. As you know, we previously passed this bill through the House in 2017. 
I'm grateful to my colleagues, especially Chairman Pappas, Dr. Dunn, and Representative Custer for joining me on this legislation to ensure that the overwhelming majority of law-abiding, veteran-owned small businesses and service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses can take full advantage of the Vets First program. Unfortunately, there are those who abuse the system by subcontracting out all or substantially all of the work they have been contracted to perform. For this reason, the Protecting Business Opportunities for Veterans Act would give VA the much-needed tools to crack down on these bad actors. I urge the committee to support this legislation, which will save taxpayer dollars by eliminating unnecessary layers of contractor profit, improve the efficiency of VA contracting, and benefit hardworking veteran entrepreneurs who play by the rules. We cannot tolerate abuse of the system which risks giving the Vets First program a bad name. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you, General Bergman. Um, is there any further discussion on H.R. 561, Dr. Rowe? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Veterans First program has helped numerous service-disabled, veteran-owned small businesses receive contracts from VA. In fiscal year 2018, it provided uh, over $5 billion in contracts for these companies. Unfortunately, the committee and broader veteran community continues to see non-veteran-owned companies take advantage of this program and fraudulently claim veteran-owned small business status. These pass-through companies take businesses that should be going to legitimate service disabled veteran-owned small businesses. General Bergman's bill would give VA more tools to stop these improper pass-through payments by requiring that companies certify their veteran-owned small business status and requiring that VA refer suspected violators to the Inspector General. This is a bill that passed the House last Congress, and I'm thankful that General Bergman has once again introduced it. It has my full support today, and I yield back. Thank you, Dr. Rowe. Is there any further debate on H.R. 561? If not, the question is, is on agreeing to H.R. 561. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say no. Uh, in the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and H.R. 561 is agreed to. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. Uh, I now recognize uh, Ranking Member Rowe for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that H.R. 561 be reported favorably to the House of Representatives. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the motion is agreed to. Without objection, uh, the staff is authorized to make necessary technical and conforming changes in the committee's amendments. Mr. Chairman, pursuant to House Rule 11, Clause 2, I give notice of intent to file minority or supplemental additional or dissenting views. Uh, without objection, so ordered. Uh, I thank uh, all the members uh, for being here at the, today's markup. Uh, thank each of you for being here. Uh, this meeting is now adjourned. Well, I used to get worried when Walls would bring two 20-ounce Mountain Dews in. <laughs> <laughs> and you brought three bottles of water. So